Okay, so here in the morning light playing uh, God Kings, and this is the third round of the first turn. And our good friends, the Mitanni, who are doing quite well, are going to play a card for three points in order to activate um, their big pile. And they move one, they're going to have four movement points. Two, replacing the Egyptian with one of their own control markers. And now, what they'd love to do is be able to do this to another one, but they can't. So they're going to move into Kadash. Which will be along this way. Now, the Egyptians don't want to fight here. Uh, they can't put their whole army inside the city for a siege. Cities is, cities is, cities were quite small at that point. Um, so, and, and some of the armies were fairly large size, actually. So within the walls of the city, there just wouldn't be room for the whole army. There's actually room for up to two units and the garrison that's there. There's no real advantage to having armies there, though. So Tutmos is going to try to withdraw. He can't face uh, another round of combat here. He's going to lose some ground. So... Let's see, we've got some restrictions here, but what we really need is this, the modifiers. Minus one if a lone general, that's a good, bo uh, it's a bonus. Minus one if the uh, avoiding army has more chariots or if it's solely chariots. I don't think either of those is the case. I think we only have one or two chariots in here and the Assyrian force is fairly large. Now the goal on any reaction movement is, I believe, uh, to roll your leader's number or less, but it may be uh, Yeah, leader's number or less. So he needs a four or less to get out of here. Otherwise, he's going to have to face another round of bat another battle against uh, the Hitani or Mitani. And he succeeds, so he can pull back a space. He uses standard retreat rules, I believe. And now the Mitani are here. Since they did not fight a battle, they're allowed to actually engage in a round of siege, I believe. Um, it ends in an enemy garrison walled city and can do it as no cost. Um, so we have to figure out the siege resolution die roll. Uh, modifier. And that's going to be any modifiers given by action cards plus the total number on any siege continue minus the walled city's printed siege modifier modifier. Um, the printed modifier isn't really printed. That's a level 2 fortified city essentially, or a level 1 fortification. That is going to give a minus 1 to the die roll. And what do we have to do with that? Well, we determine the outcome. We'll be rolling on the siege table. That'll be pretty simple. That's just right here. And we need... Looks like a 4 through 6. Let's make sure the Egyptians don't have some kind of card which can make a siege worse. I don't believe they do. And I don't think anybody else wants to waste a card on the Mitanni at this point. It's a 1. That's not sufficient. So we look... We have a city under siege and a siege continued marker. Strangely, the city under siege, I'm not sure why those are there. Um, I'm not sure what use those markers serve. I kind of wish they had... Uh, oops. Alright, I'll fix this in a bit. But you kind of wish they had 
double-sided siege continue markers. Uh, nah, it's possible. If he had uh, fought a battle here, the city would be officially under siege. And you do want to mark that it's different ownership. So I guess a few of those would be potentially useful. But uh, as it is, they all say city under siege or plus one. So there could be a fair couple of them uh, if the siege fails for a while. Um, now, the garrison, it, the only thing it does is forces a siege, and likewise, uh, regular units can do the same thing if they're inside the city. It doesn't really affect the odds of the siege, so putting more units in wouldn't have helped. All right, let's go on to, I guess, our next, which is going to be the Hati. Well, the Hati opened, uh, uh, took their turn, played a one-point card to just grab... Uh, this political control marker and uh, you know they're planning on moving up here and taking some of this section as well uh, the problem here I'm looking at the Egyptians and I've got a force back here and I've got lead all my leaders here one two three four five one of them could make it back, but that would cost an activation. I'd have to put a one or two point card to throw the leader back here and then another one to come back. That's not terrible. But uh, I seem to remember that there was a, an automatic displacement. Well, the, when I looked at it, it looks like that automatic displacement is only um, available on a retreat. You can displace the army instead of taking a retreat. Um, that's a little painful and not really what I intended here. So I'm probably going to move Tutmos back, grab the troops, and come back again. And indeed I did that. And then our good Kassites expanded into Assyria. Um, I saw I had accidentally taken the counter from here. I put that back. They spent a three-point card to grab the rest of Assyria. Remember, they have a card that's going to help them if they get both of these entirely. And that's what they're aiming for. All right, well, that moves us into the fourth round. And we start at the beginning again. Some of the players are running a little low on cards. Looks like Egypt has enough to make it through. You have an extra card in your hand. Uh, well, actually, two. You're dealt seven cards in a turn but you only have five opportunities to play a card. So it's fairly likely. Now, there's a good chance that you may play an action card or something, but it's fairly likely you'll have cards that you just don't necessarily want to play. And yes, you have the opportunity to hold a card, but if you don't have something you want at the end, if it was something you just couldn't play, you probably just want to discard it. So the Matani are in kind of a rough position. They can continue their siege with any card. I mean. This is the kind of rough position people want in a, in a military game, right? Um, but all they have left are three-point cards, the best cards possible, sufficient to move anything and certainly sufficient to get their big army in play. Three-point cards also tend to be kind of good, popular upheaval, could steal a province from someone. It doesn't give it to them, but it gets rid of it if they wanted to hurt someone. An extra speedier movement for um, an army might be useful. Well, they want to get the siege out of the way, though. They don't want to play a speedier movement card. So they're going to play the upheaval, because if they can clear this out, they can more or less take Egypt away. Pop it, well, you can't take somebody out of the game entirely, because their home country resurrects every time. But they can put it down to a blocking in the Sinai, or, or at least make everything that they can against Egypt come. So they're going to go for this, and they get to roll on the siege table again. Uh, normal roll, except plus one for the continuation. So now it's a three or higher. And they happen to get it. So the siege continued marker goes. The garrison is destroyed. And they get merely a political control. I believe. We'll check that in a moment. So these big 
stacks of counters, I have to be really careful because they're very slickery. And they might come popping out like we saw a little earlier. Got to be careful pulling hairs away too. Um, I had just woken up and my fingers were a little clumsier than they even normally are. But there are holding boxes off on the, on the uh, play aids. I've grown somehow, I used to really like those kind of things. I've grown to kind of dislike them, especially with the videos. I can show the size of the armies here. And in this game, size kind of matters. Um, it's not, in some games you can't tell by the size of the stack what you're facing. But here it really does kind of give you a feel and a good image of what's going on. And thus, a stack like this moving makes a difference to a stack like that. Now playing opposed, are the stacks viewable? Yeah, I believe they are. I believe you're allowed to examine uh, each other's uh, holding areas. So it's not a hidden movement aspect, in which case I would actually probably play with it. Uh, I, like, I like to keep my armies hidden from myself while I'm moving them. Um, okay, well, that's our Mitanni, and we'll move on. Well, the Mitanni choice is kind of a painful one because Tutmos has been able to come up with another division. And now he's got near parity again, with his better leadership, eh, maybe he's got a shot. He doesn't have the chariot bonus, though. Uh, I believe the uh, Mitanni have a serious chariot advantage right now. But we'll see what go what happens here. Um, and then we have the Cassites. And the Cassites finish up playing a two-point card, grabbing the last two areas in Mari. Right now they have all of Assyria and four areas in Mari, including the fort, so they own that. Let's go back to the uh, Hattie, which we kind of skipped before. They spent movement points, grab this space, move here, grab this space. That's one, two, three, and then four, leaving an empty space here. They still need to get another space before they own this territory. And then once they own both of these, they can try to spread out more to the, uh, more to the west. They may be coming to some kind of agreement here with the Mitanni, because the Mitanni are beyond the card that was played. The Mitanni are locked in a war, and uh, the Hadi have a light force enough to perhaps hold things into play. On the other hand, maybe they want to take Mitanni territory if this is left open. They have to think about that uh, when it comes to the diplomacy for the next turn. Speaking of which, we're on the next round, and we're back to the Mitanni. Okay, so still the Mitanni have an issue here. Now they're facing a larger army. They don't really know if they want to just attack it. They might be able to accumulate better odds if they can get their production points in play. They're bigger than the Egyptians. Now, they have their whole army here facing the Egyptian whole army. Their army is not going to get much bigger, and they're going to be facing a threat here. Even if they defeat the Egyptian army, a lot of it's going to come back. So their decision here is to make life tough on Egypt with this popular upheaval card. Uh, it hits a province of your choice but not a home country. Remove all PC markers and spaces without one or more units. The question is what is a unit would a garrison have counted but it doesn't matter here. They're going to just take Canaan. Hmm away from the Egyptians. It's just gone. It's now neutral. It's kind of a, a real pain uh, for Egypt because not only do they have troops they're going to be losing here, but now they're kind of uh, in an unsupported position. I'm not sure what that's going to mean in terms of, well, in terms of retreat, I believe they're allowed to retreat to such positions, but I also have to look at what it means in terms of their production, etc. Overall, I was just doing it because it cuts off the two points that they're getting there and maybe makes their movement a little bit more unsupported. They've already lost uh, Amaru with the, the fall of uh, the two, two seconds they've had. And actually, that's switched over to a Mitanni territory because it only requires four. Oh, no. Neither one has it because they both have a walled city. So, or, so they've taken that away. They've taken Canaan away now. 
and they're really doing a lot of damage to Egypt's position. Uh, we'll move on and see what some of the other powers are doing as they kind of feather their own nest. Now, to me, it looks like at the very least the Sumerians are about ready to move against the Mitanni as well. So the Hadi uh, finished up and grabbed one more area up here with a one point card. And now we're on the Egyptians and I had to look up the rules about what Canaan's going to do. And this is indeed going to prevent them from reinforcing Amaru. They may have to come to some sort of agreement uh, with the Mitanni. This is a painful thing though. This is, the next turn is their Tutmos turn. This is their good turn for him. They'll have him a little bit in the, in, in the, fun, in the third turn as well. But they can't afford to go to peace, sort of. So they probably will not choose to here. But it does put them in a position where they have to consider it at least. Now, the other thing um, that it does is if they lose all of Amaru, it could cause them some retreat problems where they have to retreat through spaces. But because there's no political control marker of the enemy there, they're allowed to do it without suffering penalties. But then it makes it much, much harder. You know, they do want to build that uh, territory up at some point, no matter what, I think. And it's really not that hard, but it's a backfield kind of, you know, cleanup situation that has to be done. And right now, they can't reinforce what they've got, which is going to be kind of painful. Okay. So, well, we'll pick their card. They have one card. They kind of would have liked to hold this card, to tell you the truth. But they don't really have that option. I'm going to pull back and start building things up. One, two. Actually, one, two. Yeah, one, two, three. Four. They'll grab the uh, the territories they can. Yeah. I don't like this. I don't know if they could have held it to tell you the truth. Because I think they have to play an action card on their on their action events. And now we go finally to these Cassites who will play their King of the Four Worlds regions. Yeah, my back hurts. That's why things are kind of jerkier than usual. Um, if you control the provinces of Sumer, Mari, and Assyria, and they do right now, so they've just gained three victory points. And that'll be for this turn. All right. And now... That's the end of the round. But there's some cleanup at the end of the turn. Which we have to go through. For example, calculate victory point gains for control provinces and adjust the current turn victory point markers. Well, what are you seeing for control provinces? Let's take a look, since we were working with the Cassites just a moment ago, we'll take a look at what it, uh, and by the way, I mistakenly called them the Sumerians. They're the Babylonians. The Sumerians are a minor power. Um, so they get two victory points uh, for Sumer. What do they get here? Is that four or two? Victory points is the big one. So they get four there. They're at six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They control this. Eleven, twelve, thirteen victory points that they're going to grab. Not quite twenty. But they're kind of close for not a lot of territory. That's scary. Now granted, it's because they played that card. Uh, maybe they should have held that. If they could have gotten, you know, f four more victory points, if they could have taken, say, Mitanni out, they could win the game with a card like that. But you know what? That card's going to be back in the deck, and maybe they're looking at building up their victory points over time rather than the quick win. Let's take a look at others. Well. We can get rid of this, but let's see someone else. Um, well, we'll work our way up. Egypt. Egypt is going to get four, five, and that's it. And that'll 
over here. Big painful difference. Of course, this was the turn Egypt supposed to break out, or next turn is the turn Egypt supposed to break out, and begin collecting more. I'll come back after I calculate the rest of them so we can do the rest of the victory phase. Okay, well, um, the Hatti aren't doing much better than the Egyptians. They ended up with a total of five, about the same. Remember, though, they start in the weakest position. And then the Mitanni, who started quite well, were worth 15 victory points. They had one left over, so they're at 16. Now, the next thing we do is calculate losses if you had lost your home country. That should really be done at the same time. Uh, no sudden death victory. Turn order for next turn. Hey, who got the least points? Well, that's a tie between Egypt and the Hatti. And I'm going to have to look up to see who gets to go first because of that. Uh, that goes to total victory points. Um, it sounds like at this point in the game that's just going to be a tie and I have to roll a die. So either the Hadi on odds or the Egyptians get it. And the Egyptians get the first choice. Where do they want to go? Hmm. They'll go last. They don't feel like they want to make the first move. They feel like they want to see what the Mitanni are doing and force them to commit themselves. They've got some space here. And we go to the Hadi and they very clearly want to go late. Um, and now we have two at 16 as well and they have the same total victory points so we'll do the same with them and the uh, Babylonians get to choose first and they of course will go later and that puts us on the Mitanni having to go first again okay now we'll uh, adjust the current victory point uh, and add it to the total and what do we have? We have five here. That'll be Egypt's total. And likewise with each of these others. Um, we're going to see 16 total over here for the Kassites. 16 total for Mitanni. And five for Hadi. Okay, well... That's kind of the end of things. Let's see if the end of turn phase says, it says you discard cards. Yeah, okay, so there is actually a covering of that. So everybody gets to choose to discard cards if they like. Now, with the Hadi, it's kind of painful. They have two cards they like. A three-point card that they'd like to keep, just because it's three points, and a one-point card that they really like because it gives you an extra unit, the Royal Guard, in case things get ugly. Right now, they want to up their point total to building, though. So they're going to throw that kind of cool one-time card. Now, this gets flipped. This says they can't keep a card next turn. The Mitanni, they want to keep this because there's a lot of room for them to grab. So they also flip. The Babylonians, do they like their cards? Well, they have two cards, and they want the Army Reform card in their hand. So they'll throw this one away, and that flips. And that is the end of the turn. We're going to be moving into the second turn, where we see we have new leaders for the Hathi. It don't appear bad, about the same. And then a successor who's not as good. And then for the Kashites, uh, their king, they get a new one who's not going to be any worse and with a successor who's a little better and that's about the end of this one up it goes I know it's a little longer than I wanted to do I thought about splitting it in two but I didn't so you're stuck with it all right